Hi, and welcome. Um, this is module five um, uh, assignment for course two. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen with you in just a moment. And this would be our um, school improvement plan. Um, so just wanted to say welcome. Um, and also a big um, thank you and introduction here to the school governing council rep. We have uh, Sally Hayes, school head, Billy Brywall, um, our amazing teacher team, Andrea Lawson, Dave Wells, um, all part of team uh, teacher team one, students, of course, um, who've helped out with it from the student council, getting things organized and getting the ball rolling there. Um, school council president, Alex Downing. Of course, our parent teams, we've got Greg Olson, uh, Sherry Netzlaff, uh, Maggie Dawson. And um, we couldn't have done this uh, as well without our school community members. Um, so good evening. Um, my name is Ruth Davkis, and I'm here to present the school improvement plan. Uh, really, the purpose of the plan is to identify areas where we can improve our school and develop strategies to help us achieve our goals. Um, so a little bit of background here about um, Sally. Um, she's actively been um, participating in the development of the SIP, of the school improvement plan. She's been setting up priorities as well as setting goals and aiming uh, strategies for improvement. Um, she's been key to initiate the formation of the school planning team. Um, then next we have Billy Brywall. Um, this is, he is our school head and he has, he, um, he convenes the school planning process and the team and he gives leadership and guidance to develop the plan itself. Um, and he's helped us outline and clearly explain the process as we go. Um, he's also helped everyone tackle their own roles and responsibilities and really understand them, um, as well as facil facilitates an actual planning workshop um, for support. Um, just the teachers, Andrea and Dave, to name a few, um, give us really the needed information about the process of teaching and learning, um, and who also actively participated in the school improvement plan. They help us set goals, formulate, strategize, uh, and plan. Uh, as well as implementation of this. Um, parent teams. Uh, parent teams have been essential. Uh, they have shared ideas and insights about um, what their kids need to learn, challenges they face, and desires and aspirations for the future. They've presented concerns and priorities, also have committed um, vast resources to implement the plan. A uh, little bit of background on our vision. At ABC District, we will provide an education that encourages all students to reach their full potential and to become responsible, productive citizens. Um, this kind of coincides with um, the acronym that we know and love so well uh, with uh, We Are GP. We are empowered, accepting, respectful, educated, goal-oriented, personally responsible. And this also holds us accountable. Um, we try to reinforce this commitment to our vision and mission. Um, and it's, it's really geared towards encompassing and explaining the, dis the district's purpose and our overall intention here. The team, um, the collaborative teams shared vision for school improvement. The school improvement team does recognize that these, these gaps exist. Um, and our intention, um, we've set intention to close these gaps um, and to create a more equitable and diverse school. So through the process of equity and inclusion, collaboration and teamwork, continuous improvement, community engagement um, and resources um, are all maximized because these goals help identify special strategies to allocate resources appropriately. Though the assembled leaders may not be experts in everything, the group represents an extraordinary amount of academic learning. And I think that our group really does have this vast, storage um, of knowledge that we can really tap into. Um, 
So not everyone might be, uh, you know, an expert in everything, but the group represents an amazing, extraordinary amount of talent and um, academic learning. I think we've got like 300 years of experience between the teacher teams and the admin and our amazing staff. So just wanted to share that with you. Moving on to our evidence-based strategies. Um, so we have identified um, some key areas that we want to focus on in our school improvement plan, that being math and ELA, math and um, English language arts. We've identified that we are going to be using evidence-based research-based strategies. We're going to be using data analysis and evidence review. We also are going to be developing our own SMART goals, which is also evidence-based. Um, just a quick um, reference to, you know, what is a SMART goal? Um, well, it has to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, we have identified some opportunities. We like to look at them as opportunities and problems through our data analysis and evidence review. Um, this being that student achievement in ELA and math um, is lacking. And so we are now developing a school improvement goal. This is our SMART goal. It is evidence-based. It's a strategy to support these goals um, where we take adequate steps to collaboratively develop a school improvement goal and evidence-based strategy to meet our goal. Um, we realize that this does require a systematic approach and adhesion strong adhesion to our SMART goals and the process. Again, of it being a specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Um, it's the specific framework that's used here to develop the goals. So they are clear, focused, have a higher likelihood of success. We've identified uh, three implementation strategies. The first being direct instruction, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, or a lot of our teachers. <laughs> um, so we're, we're giving, you know, just making sure we're using explicit, systematic um, instruction, scaffolding, where you're breaking down uh, some of these, unpacking these, um, you know, standards, um, and providing scaffolding in the classroom um, and breaking down complex tasks into manageable chunks, as well as modeling uh, where we're really demonstrating um, as well. Um, so our timeline, this kind of also coincides with our timeline for goal number one. It paral parallels the, our fall, winter, and spring assessments. Click down. Okay. There we go. All right. Bear with me, friends. Okay. <laughs> um, so those are our three implementation strategies. Um, through the process of the equity curriculum audit, uh, we've come up with a summary of findings, and we have realized that um, there are discrepancies for English language learners. Um, it revealed um, that our curriculum audit revealed 5% of English language, language learners in the third grade, um, only 5% of English language learners in the third grade are meeting state standards in language arts. 11% um, of the eighth graders in math, um, only 11% of the eighth graders in math um, are also meeting state standards compared to uh, a whopping 31% in ELA for all students and 32% for all students in math. So there's some pretty big discrepancies here. Through um, our summary of findings, uh, we've created a, gap, a graph here that kind of walks us through, you know, well, this is two years of student achievement data disaggregated by diverse subgroups. Uh, the first being um, ELLs in third grade meeting uh, standards in language arts, um, ELLs in eighth grade meeting standards in language arts. Um, and then we have all students um, here. So we can, we've identified this as 
a gap. And we really realize that there, there's room to grow here. Um, so um, through the curriculum audit, um, you know, these are gaps between best practices uh, identified as best as gaps between best practices for diverse and, and equitable school culture and data findings. So because the ELLs have a significant gap, which is upwards of 20%, if you look at some of these numbers, okay, um, this gap right here, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a pretty big number. So um, this exists, this exists between the lower and upper grade uh, English language learners and all students. So there might be many factors here that contribute to this. And there are a lot of intervening variables. Um, and so we, we recognize that a lot of factors can contribute to why and address these factors. Uh, addressing these factors requires a collaborative approach from our team. Um, we have to look to best practices, provide some intensive support for our ELLs, um, language development, and, and meeting the unique needs of each student. However, data findings um, do show an inadequate support for ELLs, English language learners, when they should have appropriate instructional materials and language development assessments. For example, a lot of um, cultural and, as you know, cultural and linguistic uh, differences exist. Um, there are many idi idiomatic expressions in English. Um, and it also it matters whether, you know, a, a language learner, um, you know, where they're at in their L1 or their native language to begin with. Um, there are vocabulary hurdles, um, there's figurative language that comes, you know, from sheer experience um, with L2 or with, English as a second language. Um, we've also uh, become aware of testing bias and limited resources. Um, it's just some of the things to think about, um, you know, these also contribute to why our ELLs struggle. Language placement exams, such as the widely used Woodcock Munoz and even the ELPA do contain inherent cultural biases and elements of cultural nuances that ELLs simply are not exposed to in L1. Um, so just some things to think about. We will come back to this later when we are looking at this 20% this gap right here. So we're, we're working to close the gap, okay? We do not want the gap. Um, as um, in the equity curriculum audit as well, are some additional summary of findings. Um, you know, we broke this down a little bit further. Um, you know, so as you can see, um, in terms of disciplinary action um, and students by um, by race, um, there are a large percentage of Hispanic and Black our African-American students that did receive discipline and referrals. Um, so this, this is pretty high here, friends. So um, we're already at like 11%. Um, this is much higher than the overall percentage of students. So essentially our discipline uh, incidents for white students is less than typically anticipated. But uh, here, as you can see, American Indian students, um, with a Hispanic or Latino background and our African American students. So it's much higher, uh, which is this is important to take into consideration. Um, another subgroup um, in our summary of findings in the equity curriculum audit, we're you know focusing on uh, or the issue of attendance. So um, there's definitely a, a, a measurable difference between, um, you know, kind of what our tech school students are doing. Um, and we've noticed, especially that with our uh, Native American student population, um, we have a much higher rate of truancy. It's the percentage of, uh, you know, like 52%. Um, and some in tech schools, students also um, 
as high as 62.3. Our, our, our audit for attendance specifically revealed uh, some pretty large truancy issues for our tech school students um, at our trade school and our Native American students. Um, scroll down. Um, high schoolers and students on IEPs also had, um, you know, there was a lower disparity um, here um, and students uh, with IEPs, um, but still high. So this is, this is concerning, this is identified um, truancy issues that were identified in the equity curriculum audit. Uh, equity curriculum audit also dug a little bit deeper into uh, looking at how our curriculum and how our textbooks are aligning for the most part. So on the surface, they do tend to align. There are some pros and cons, for example. Um, so we have found that, um, you know, surveys have revealed that texts are inclusive. Um, we did uh, quite a few survey monkeys and got some data on that. Um, so the, the texts are inclusive and welcoming to all students. So for example, they're using inclusive language, um, images and examples that reflect the diversity of the classroom. Um, on the flip side, um, well, also let me continue with the pros. Um, you know, there's a broader and historical context for the events and people um, is covered. So they do acknowledge, you know, some of the pros, they are acknowledging the impact of colonialism, slavery, and other forms of oppression. Um, again, okay, so now moving down to the flip side, the cons are that we do need, uh, it did highlight um, that we need more highlighting of the contributions and perspectives of marginalized groups. So this, again, um, this is what we're looking to improve upon. More highlighting of contributions and perspectives of marginalized groups, such as African-Americans, women, um, Native Americans. So we will come back to that. Um, let's see here. Um, as far in the realm of technology in the equity curriculum audit, um, we realized that no technology was not equitable, okay? So technology resources and access to technology are simply not always equitable across all of our grade levels and student groups. Um, this, in the most part, you know, is due to limited funding. So we, do, we know and we are aware that we struggle to provide all students with access to technology resources, including computers, tablets, and internet connectivity. <clears throat> so we just don't have enough staff members with the necessary expertise to support the technology integration piece and ensure that students have equal access to technology resources. So students from low-income families may not have access to technology resources at home like we would like them to. This can impact their ability to complete homework assignments and access online learning material. So this was, um, this technology piece came out of the equity curriculum audit and we, we are not equitable in that area or it is not equitable in that area. Um, because there, there was so much in the equity curriculum audit uh, we had to kind of break it down and just select some specific areas for improvement. So we could really look at, um, uh, you know, three areas that were, we felt that were important and impacted our schools. Low graduation rates, um, chronic absenteeism, and overall math and language arts performance. So, um, you know, we could we want to select again we we want these goals to be achievable um, we want to make them smart goals so we we are picking three that impact our school the most okay um, 
as far as why, a little bit of background here, uh, we, you know, we selected these areas for improvement. Well, low graduation rates um, stem from it, a lot of socioeconomic issues, okay, or, or can stem from many issues, but <laughs> can, um, you know, there are socio and economic concerns. So students who are not graduating are, you know, um, they struggle with unemployment, poverty, poor health, crime, and these are some consequences, um, as well as, you know, affecting student success. Um, we know that diploma is essential for post-secondary education, uh, or, or students could face limited job prospects. Um, low graduation, uh, as far as accountability, um, and the, it affects the academic achievement of students. So um, it's it not just affects students negatively. Um, you know, this is something that we really need to take a look at because it, we need to hold ourselves accountable um, in terms of the academic achievement of students weak and negatively affecting funding um, and reputation, as well as legal requirements. Um, minimum state graduation rate and failure means lacking funding. So we, this uh, is just some of the rationale be behind why we selected this area of low graduation rates uh, as, it, as our first area of concern for improvement. Uh, the next area of concern um, is the chronic absenteeism which uh, on the equity audit and the um, was shown uh, the curriculum audit to be, or in the equity audit to sh was shown to be a concern. Um, and it's concerning because, um, you know, what, what, it, what happens with, but with chronic absenteeism? Well, typically um, students who are experiencing high rates of truancy have poor academic performance. So they're more likely to fall behind, get lower grades. Um, they are also more likely to have additional social emotional issues um, associated with chronic absenteeism, social isolation, anxiety, and depression. Um, studies have shown that there's an increased dropout rate, um, you know, for like a lot of students experiencing chronic absenteeism also are the same students who miss graduation. Um, there's also some financial consequences, right? As far as schools losing funding based on chronic absenteeism. So second area selected for improvement is chronic absenteeism. The third area, um, you know, we put a lot of thought into this and we are concerned with our ELLs um, and um, students with on IEPs, um, but we really wanted to zero in on math and language arts performance across the board. Um, the reason being is that these are key foundational skills. These are basic skills. So they're the building block to the foundational skills um, that students need. Um, you know, as far as, you know, having good, um, it, this affects high stakes tests, as we all know, you know, performance, standardized test, uh, and again, um, reputation and funding. Um, we selected um, uh, this area as because of, um, you know, another reason would be college and career readiness. You know, students need to have these foundational skills. They, they can be better prepared, successful in the workplace. Um, as well as uh, going back to this whole idea of equity and access. This opens up opportunities regardless of the socioeconomic status. So we need all of our kiddos to be, um, we wanna look at all of our students' performance in math and language arts. Um, and these are just a few reasons why. Um, again, with, we, we are keeping our, our, the English language learners in mind. Um, as we tackle this, uh, you know, especially goal number three, um, you know, just thinking about, this is kind of a, a fun 
um, slide that our teachers um, and students put together um, in our bilingual classroom, just to remind us about you know, some struggles that English language learners have that we may not realize. Um, idioms, <laughs> it's an everyday figure of speech or a metaphorical expression whose meaning cannot be taken literally. They often go against the logical rules of language and grammar, um, despite being commonly used by the language's native speakers. So as native speakers, we completely take these for granted, like a light on a wall. Um, or, um, you know, you're skating on thin ice. Are you really skating on thin ice? No. Uh, and that's why English can be so tricky um, for a lot of our English language learners. So um, thanks to the ELL department um, and the bilingual classroom for bringing this up. Felt like we had it. We just really needed to include this um, just to reiterate the, how important um, and concerned we are for our English language learners as we go through this school improvement plan process. Um, so language barriers exist. English is, uh, you know, it's amazing that these kids speak two languages. Uh, we need to celebrate that. Um, you know, it's of course of a different color, um, not literal, friends, not literal. Okay, moving on to our goals. Um, the measurable goal um, that we are specifically looking at here that we have seen uh, and identified as chronic absenteeism. We do know um, data and evidence has revealed that 90% of students in all subgroups, um, we want them to be regular attenders. So we want them to be missing less than 10% of the school year uh, is our goal for chronic absenteeism. Um, goal number two, low graduation rates. Um, our goal is to have 90% of all students disaggregated by subgroup will graduate from high school with a regular or modified diploma within four years of their start of high school. For example, with uh, freshmen earning at least six credits by the end of ninth grade. And our third goal um, for, uh, this would be for language art, uh, math and language arts. Um, so by June 2020, the percentage of students will increase by 10% to a goal of 40% of students, third, eighth grade, and 10th grades in all subgroups, will meet state grade level expectations in English language arts and mathematics. This is district wide here, folks. Um, and we will be administering a pre and post test. This is, a, we'll be looking at measurable changes in knowledge and skills followed by observations and feedback. So these are our three goals um, and how they are measurable. Um, looking back to goal number one, as you know, for chronic absenteeism, we've kind of put some strategies in place here for that. Um, so in August, um, we will be going through our district-wide diversity training. Um, let me get the highlighter. Um, and looking at educational equity across the board. Um, equity will be reviewed. Um, we'll be looking at if it's, is it culturally non-biased? Is it relative to the students and is it applicable? Is it relevant and applicable to their daily lives? We will be providing here in the fall, uh, coaching and support to minorities that are we've identified that are not on the path to graduation. Um, this will be followed up with um, administrative walkthroughs. We're hoping that um, you know through observation we will have identified that at least sixty percent of all um, teachers will be using some of these new strategies um, uh, and curriculum and research uh, based. Um, strategies that we put forth. Um, so winter, again, um, in, in winter, we will uh, be doing a lot within our PLC groups. Um, we will have meetings with stakeholders. Um, so we will be actively, uh, as far as checking in with students and making sure they can access the courses they need. Of course, observations come in as well, just with, you know, principals in the classrooms, you know, are we being welcoming? 
Um, at this administrative walkthrough, we're looking for at least 70, we're hoping to have improved, uh, you know, 10% here, looking for at least 70% of um, teachers really implementing these strategies that we've talked about and that we've, um, that we've been learning for spring. Our goal um, laid out for spring, well, that, you know, we will have, by, coaching will be facilitated. Um, uh, as far as they're reaching our goal for chronic absenteeism. Um, we'll be, you know, the school staff will be looking at minority students. We, the district will be providing additional training and support um, through regular reporting, um, uh, through to the administration, district, community, and the school board. Uh, again, by this point in the year, by spring, we're hoping that you know, evidenced by administrative walkthrough, now we're gonna be up to at least 80% of teachers district-wide are implementing these, these strategies that we've identified as being helpful for um, combating our chronic absenteeism problem. So this is an opportunity for growth. We're gonna be looking at at least 60% in the fall implementing these strategies, 70% by winter and 80% here uh, by spring. So we're gonna take it step by step and make sure we methodically go through and meet each of our goals along the way. Uh, strategies for low graduation rates include, again, we've broken this down by fall, winter, and spring. Um, additionally, this is also when we're doing our um, universal screeners um, and our the whole assessment piece. So. Fall, our goal is to have trained staff. We already have great, amazing staff trained on iReady um, diagnostics, um, progress monitoring, and response to intervention. Um, our special education department will be doing some PD and some direct instruction. Um, we are purchasing new SPED interventions, okay? Um, a lot of you have asked if it's gonna be the push in or pull out, um, <clears throat> uh, intervention, and we will talk some more about that. Um, it's research has proven that <clears throat> the push-in model has, uh, does work best. Um, so dependent upon staffing issues, um, that's the direction that we plan on taking. Again, um, you know, we will be, uh, this will be evidenced by um, you know, measures, um, we're going to look at administrative walkthroughs again, starting at least 60% of teachers implementing this in the classroom in the fall um, at launch and by winter. Um, you know, seven, we're looking at hopefully 70%. We need at least a 10% increase. Um, winter, some of the strategies that we will be using are um, PLC meetings, we'll be reviewing data and decisions, looking, digging into the data, uh, raw data and um, as well, and looking at the student results and the outcomes. We will be doing a progress review, okay, in the winter um, to check our student, to see if our students getting the interventions they need. Um, as far as RTI and response to intervention, you know, are these tier changes happening and are they effective? Okay, and our staff will uh, continue to identify these strategies. Again, hoping through administrative evidence through administrative walkthroughs, we are hoping that 70% of staff will be really integrating these. Um, by spring, um, some strategies are, uh, you know, we're gonna continue to review and review the data um, and student progress in our PLCs. Uh, we will then um, be able to adjust and prioritize. Um, we can also be looking by spring, we're gonna be looking ahead to next year. And even, um, you know, what could be happening over the summer to support these students, um, you know, to see if they are making progress. We hope by spring, through as evidence through admin walkthrough, we'll be up to 70% of teachers implementing this in their classroom. Um, goal three, our strategies for math and language arts. Um, we've laid, that, laid this out a little bit more specifically. Um, as far based, um, just so we can have some proper management um, and really increase our student achievement 
for language arts and math. So by September 10th, this is where we'll be purchasing um, our new materials for RTI. Uh, staff training will continue. There's There will be additional progress monitoring and um, curriculum. By June 10th, um, we will hopefully we've determined which monitoring aid. Um, and June 15th, this is where we'll, we'll, our goal is to really have more P, uh, professional development, um, our PLCs, and really be checking in with team leaders. June 20th, uh, grade band teams will be uh, collaborating. The June 20th through the 25th, um, we'll be supporting this with on-site coaching, review of the tiered instructional practices and RTI there. Um, adjustment strategy. So how will we know, especially focusing in on language arts and math, how will we know our plan is working? Um, well, in the fall, we'll know our plan is working because we're going to be implementing tiered support. We're going to be, we'll look at our established baseline in math and language arts. In the winter, we will do a check-in on progress monitoring for math and language arts and adjust it if we need to. Are you know our students making growth? Are they um, you know making a benchmark? We're looking for a measurement here of um, at least a, you know uh, ten percent improvement. So plus ten percent. Um, spring as well. Um, you know we might need to make some adjust adjustments. How do we know that our plan is working? Well, we'll look at make you know ask our and look at the data and see, are they making growth? What are the summative assessments like? By that time, our students will have test, uh, gone through state testing, so we can look at SBAC scores. Um, so not only will we be looking at Smarter Balance, we'll have iReady um, in language arts and math, and our ultimate goal here of uh, increase by 20% for spring. This, so if we need to make adjustments along the way, we can. It, it is 100% uh, possible. Um, yeah. So, yep, 20%. Um, we're looking at just how have students made this goal and how can, if we need to, we can adjust along the way. Um, so, I am. I am. I'm really excited about our school improvement team uh, together. Um, you know, let's commit to creating a culture of excellence at our school. We're going to be working collaboratively. We're going to be strategizing, identifying these areas of improvement, implementing our evidence-based strategies. We know this will help our students succeed academically and socially. Um, you know, we must we must provide. Go back to our mission statement um, and our vision that you know we must provide a safe and supportive learning environment that fosters uh, student engagement personal growth and achievement. Um, let's hold ourselves accountable for the success of every student. And let's work together to create a school where all students thrive. Um, you know, join us <laughs> in this important work uh, by volunteering, providing feedback when asked, um, supporting our efforts to really improve our school. Uh, and together we can make a difference. Um, so this call to action emphasizes again the importance of collabor collaboration um, and commitment to creating a culture, a culture of excellence at our school. And it invites stakeholders to get involved and support the improvement efforts. Um, so above all, we can do it. Um, go back to our, um, you know, our vision here. Um, uh, just one of our, you know, goals as, as staff, you know, though the assembled leaders may not be experts in everything, the group represents an extraordinary amount of academic learning and it, it does. We have an amazing staff. Thanks.